You're listening to the Blue Raider Podcast, your number one resource for all the latest news, updates, and game recaps from Middle Tennessee Athletics. Join us every Tuesday for our weekly interviews with players, coaches, and local media personalities alike. Thanks for tuning in, and don't forget to like and subscribe on all our socials. We're on Instagram, X, Twitter, and TikTok, at Blue Raider Pod. If you're currently listening on your favorite streaming service, we also offer a visual presentation on YouTube at Blue Raider Podcast. Lastly, I'd love to hear your feedback, so don't forget to subscribe to GoMiddle.com to discuss this week's episodes along with the latest news and updates around Middle Tennessee. The Blue Raider Podcast. I'm your host, Jake Bolden, and today is Tuesday, April 2nd, and it is the part two edition of the Blue Raider Podcast interview with MTSU Athletic Director Chris Massaro. Mr. Massaro, how, how's it going? Great, Jake. Uh, spring weather's been perfect, and, and it's nice to see a little warmth coming our, to our area. Oh, absolutely. And, and I know that there's a lot of things that come with that warm weather. I know last time we, we kind of teased the opening of the outdoor tennis facility, and now you've got the SAPC. It looks like they're rocking and rolling there with the warm weather also. Yeah, we're very excited. Uh, we've hosted four or five tennis matches at the outdoor tennis center and it's a spectacular place to watch tennis and we're just so proud and it's really done what we wanted to do on that uh, northwest corner of campus that it's helped modernize it It, that that was getting a tired look and so we also thank the student athlete performance center and a new hotel kind of in that region will really revitalize that area that's the most by traffic counts, that's the busiest intersection we have on campus is Greenland and Middle Tennessee Boulevard. So so it's important to us as a university that, that we modernize that. And it's to us as a athletic department that we that, that we, we leave those kind of good impressions. Absolutely. And that curb appeal has certainly improved. Um, with the look there at that, as you say, that modern look there with the tennis facility. And we got that conference tournament coming up here in two weeks. That's that's exciting news. But also, just to go ahead, and we talked about this before we came on, but the, the April 13th weekend there with the spring game that's coming, the blue and white game with Derek Mason, as, as well as you got baseball on campus that day. I believe you also have a softball match. So there's so much going on on campus, and, and the only one ticket for the baseball game will get you to all the activities that afternoon. Yeah, and, and it's whether it's a baseball or softball ticket, what – Whatever, any sort of ticket will get you to any of our athletic events. So you are right. We have a spring football game, uh, which is the first time in years that we've done that. Uh, we, we've got uh, baseball and softball games. And then the universities also, that's part of their uh, spring showcase as well. So a lot of colleges and stuff will be having events on campus. So April 13th is a really great day. Uh, to bring your family, bring your kids, come visit campus, see a little bit of football, a little bit of softball, a little bit of baseball, and and just kind of visit our campus as it opens its doors to the public that day. Absolutely. And it's very, very unique to have that opportunity to see that many uh, sports on campus at one given time. Um, but a lot to be excited there with, with a lot of things, given the, the football and and. Well, uh, we'll get to a lot of those things later. And I have a lot of a lot of stuff that we kind of left off the docket from the last time we were here. So that was kind of the pleasure of having you on for the second time. Um, but the main thing, and we had t- we had talked about this, and we'll go ahead and get this off now because I know that this is what everyone's tuning in to really listen to you make the comment on was um, you, you released a statement to the BRA this last week about um, the department's willingness to stick with Nick McDevitt, and I, I think uh, for a lot of us we appreciated that. I know it, in today's world in the NCAA and Division One sports, especially, it's unique, and we talk uh, we talk about you making a statement on it, and you know, ten years ago you may not have to make a statement on those kind of things, but in the age of social media and you have so much connectivity with your fans that you almost you're you're left stranding to say something at some point in time we see kentucky make the same uh, approach with calipari they make a public statement about that and you kind of made yours with bra so i'm just i'm excited to kind of hear what you have to say in regards to to our our situation here at mtsu yeah and there was a lot of noise surrounding our men's basketball program and and quite honestly and, and i said so in the letter that it did not perform up to anyone's expectations this past year, you know, and we can delve into a bunch of different reasons why that happened. But the fact is, is that uh, we thought it would be, we all thought in October 
it'd be a lot better season than what turned out. So, uh, so obviously there's disappointment when that happens. Uh, you know, and, and there, there are reasons for it. There's some things that the, the coaches tried to correct during the course of the season. And those adjustments took a while, you know, and I, I think at the end of the year, we were again, a pretty good basketball team. We were not a very good basketball team in December and January. And that's when there was a lot of experimentation that kind of had to take place. Like what, what are, what additional roles or new roles can our players adjust to? Cause they, they'd really work through the summer and fall, very specific roles and those kind of things. And then when you lose Cam, Cam Weston and you, you lose Josh, you know, big center, that's two out of your, uh, out of your rotating eight that, that are gone. And so that causes a whole different set of circumstances. So it did take us a while. Uh, I normally don't like to, to comment much on personnel matters, but did really think that because there was so much chatter that, that, hey, let's just get all behind Coach McDevitt this offseason. Let's bring a couple of really great transfers. Let's reboot the team. In my opinion, the staff is best positioned to fix whatever ails us. Uh, they, they saw it all firsthand. They study it day in, day out, and to give them a chance to go recruit to it, you know, and, and things are a little bit different now that you can, you can fall quickly, you can rise quickly, all those kind of things, uh, you know, and, and the transfer portal has changed the dynamics of the timing, you know, like App State had their best year in, in, in maybe the last 20 years, and They've got three, four guys and they're top guys in the portal, you know, and, and you just see it all over the place that, that where, where people are in the portal. And, and so uh, it's hard to sustain a program that way. And it's also easier to rebuild and reboot a program that way. So, um, so it's a little bit of a double-edged sword. I think we need to, to do, to take advantage of, of the rules as they present us do a great job in the transfer portal and also in the junior college portal because a lot of those kids are, are being overlooked now and, and to bring in three or four guys that can really help us immediately and and fit into our rotation and, and those kind of things. So so we'll see. Uh, it's a, I'm excited about it. Uh, we've got a all-conference guard that's going to be back uh, with Cam and – uh, I think we've all kind of forgotten maybe how valuable he was until he got hurt, but that's a big addition to our lineup. And he, he does a lot of things by being able to dribble drive as effectively as he does to get to the, to the basket, to do that and then open up spot shooters on the perimeter. And we really didn't have that in, in our, in our lineup. And that's one of my criticisms of this is that we didn't really have a backup plan B at point guard, you know, and, and so all the other positions appeared to be interchangeable parts, but that one really, really caused us to change our roles. So how does this staff adapt to that as well? So, um, they're, they're well-versed. They've studied it all year. They know they've been thinking about who we can get and all those kind of things. What kind of player are we looking for? So I'm, I'm very confident in their plan and uh, really think that we're going to bring in some good players to supplement some really good players that we already have on staff. You know, and the other thing that I looked at, Jake, is just to make sure, you know, we, we were trending up. Uh, the last couple of years prior to this year were, were good years, you know, and, and we came within an eyelash in a really hard league last year. We, we were in the top four or five teams in the league in a league that finished uh, with a team in the final four, a team that won the NIT, a team that was the runner up in the NIT, and the one that we finished ahead of won the CBI, and, which we did not participate in a, a year ago to, due to injuries and those kind of things. And in our semifinal game that year, we had, you know, a DeAndre Dishman with a four footer to win it with about two, three seconds left when we're down one and, and missed it. So we were right there the year before 
we lost in the semifinals to UAB in triple overtime, you know, and, and so both those teams went on to win our conference tournament, won the final. We'd have liked to have won both those games, mm -hmm. but it just wasn't to be. And, and then made the semifinals this year, and I was really hoping for that kind of performance where it'd be that sort of competitive game. And I think we were all disappointed, really disappointed in that result versus Western Kentucky. So uh, we just can't allow that to happen again. And so uh, better fix it through recruiting and off seasons and those kind of things. So when we get in that semifinals, we have to find a way to win one of those and get into the finals. And then you're playing for the NCAA tournament. Yeah, I think you summarized it well there about if, if we take a step back to how quickly things can change. Um, when you look back two years ago, we, we were, uh, I think it was five wins, and then we move, make the jump all the way up to 20 wins. So y y I think uh, with the like way the portal is now. Yeah. Yeah. 28 wins. Yeah, absolutely. So you, you look at that and how quickly things are able to change. And I also think in your letter here, um, here at the end, you say uh, your last sentence, your closing sentence is, I invite everyone to get behind Nick and his staff during this recruiting period. And I think that's essential and and, I, and maybe it was planned by you to put it that way but I think a lot of us that you know we know basketball well enough to know that like as you pointed out the lack of of ones on the team is what kind of created that problem of, of trying to shuffle players around and figure ourselves out but it sounds like and again I just love to hear you say it you know that that you know, the emphasis that you've got it what you've talked with Nick and everybody collectively as a program is recruiting is our emphasis this offseason because that can be the make or break for us because as, as we said that that class that came into 2021 was was the catalyst for for where the program was the last two years and we have a few injuries that knocks us down so i think again just to reiterate what you're saying and, and to back you up is to say that you know things can change on a dime and it, and it's a matter of an offseason that can change those things yeah and you know and to to win a championship sometimes you need a little bit of luck involved as well like that triple overtime loss against uab right before the tournament we lose our leading score and josh jefferson to, to a knee injury you know, we still play them to a triple overtime game. Uh, so so we've been right there. I, I would suggest that uh, that COVID team was a was a real disappointing team. I, I thought we were better. I thought we had uh, some cohesion. And actually, that was the year we brought in a lot of newcomers, but we had to keep people separated, mm -hmm. you know, and that, that really kept the team from bonding. And that was one of our off-seasons initiatives following COVID is how do we bring these talented guys to play better cohesive basketball? And they did that the next year, you know, and, and so uh, we brought in some newcomers this year that, that helped us, um, you know, and, and, and we, we've seen enough player development, players like Chris Loof and, you know, and how he developed uh, through the course of the year, Jared Coleman Jones, uh, on how his role changed to be the primary guy uh, from from sitting behind and being a supplementary guy to DeAndre Dishman and turns himself into a regular double double guy. Uh, so we've seen we've seen the players develop, uh, you know, and and so that also gives me encouragement. We need some of our current players to really get better as well and work on some small things, whether it's ball handling whether it's a little bit better shooting, uh, how do we, they play to their strengths and those kind of things. Uh, so uh, I'm excited to, with the nucleus that we have and the improvement that we can show and, and those kind of things with the individuals and then supplementing it with some really good uh, transfers and recruits. Absolutely. And it's, it's going to be an exciting off season. Hopefully, you know, we see some names come across as now the season's wrapping up and, um, that transfer portal starts to open up, gets vast. The other, and we'll keep it on the hardwood here, we're talking about the Lady Raiders now. Um, what an exciting run that was for them. I think we all saw it in them to go 19-0 in the conference. And I'll, I'll say this for any of the listeners, I said that back in December that they would go undefeated. Um, but they had a heck of a run there in Baton Rouge. You, you know, you, you have what at what one point was the biggest comeback of the year. And then you get swiped later and later that day, but you, you have a big win there over Louisville and you kind of have an unfortunate event there at LSU. We'll keep the referees out of it and I'll keep my bias out of it. But 
they had a heck of a run and, and that's exciting. And there's a, there's a lot that comes from that, uh, from the u- university side of things where, you know, the excitement already is there for the Lady Raiders. But I, I, I my main question to you from uh, the department standpoint and something that's come up in discussion this year was how LSU was the benefactor of being a host school. And we know last year around January, when it's time to put those bids in, we were a top 25 team and we fell out of it with the, you know, a, a bad trip to Texas there in San Antonio and El Paso. And we kind of fell out of that opportunity to host and be in that top 16 team. Uh, but where, where does, where do you lie in, in that were in women's basketball, how that, that plays out, how the homeschool or the homeschool gets to host the first two rounds. Is that good for the game of basketball, especially on the women's side? Or do you kind of think, do you think it would be better off having neutral sites like the men? I mean, Obviously, it helped LSU. I'd like to think it helped LSU and, and certainly could help us, given our record here at Murphy Center. Yeah, and I, I mean, that's a really good question, Jake. To, uh, first of all, you know, that I told the women in our locker room that, and I'll believe this till the day they put me in the ground, is that if that game's played anywhere but in the state of Louisiana, we win that game. You know, and, and just the way it was unfolding, because all of a sudden the pressure goes to them. And we've seen it in those neutral site games and those kind of things where it's happened. And and they got that little bit of confidence. That crowd was as loud. That's the loudest arena I've been in, period, whether it's NBA or or men's or women's basketball, all those kind of things. I mean, they got it going on. And and then where we needed a call kind of to break that momentum, we never got it for whatever reason. So I, I just think that we, we could have uh, added to that run. I'll, I'll always believe that. Uh, but I was really proud that th- these girls, our, our women didn't back down. You know, that they, they knew the challenge. Everybody knew it going to Baton Rouge that, that you know, if we win, we're going to face the defending national champs. Nobody was scared. Nobody was intimidated. In fact, we were excited to play them. And that's, that's the culture of that program and what Coach Ensel's done within that program. And it's all about culture and, and those kind of things. So they didn't back away from that challenge. At any time during the game, uh, they held their form. I, I think that we want a lot of fans with that uh, across the country. Two million people watched that game on ABC. So it, it had a big TV audience, and we've gotten all kinds of great feedback. You know, the women's game has been interesting because it's taken a dynamic leap the last two years. And when I I actually served on the women's basketball committee, and that was our debate at that time, we had neutral site first round games to put it to campuses and those kind of things to generate excitement for the early rounds of the tournament because it really made for poor television. And that was 10, 12 years ago. And so now when you flipped on the TV, it did make for great television, you know, and, and you look and it's a packed Pete Maravich center. Uh, you, you tune in Iowa and it's packed. Uh, Carver Whitney uh, arena is, is packed. You, you, Colonial Life Arena in Columbia, South Carolina is packed. And so you saw Reynolds Coliseum in, in, at NC State was packed. So you saw these big crowds for these early round games. And it was good. It was good television. It was good for ratings. But I do think that it that it deserves some study, you know, and, and uh, see if it, it's strong enough to go to some neutral sites. And I think that you can be strategic about your neutral sites and place it in places that you know will draw, you know, like a Charlotte, North Carolina, Nashville, Tennessee, all those that are kind of around hubs of really strong women's basketball, Indianapolis, Indiana, you know, all those kind of things where you're going to get teams that are going to fill, fill the buildings. And, and I think that'd be very helpful. So I'd like to see us look at that as a, as a sport and, and maybe really consider going back to neutral sites. And I think that the one thing missing from the women's game is still those first and second round upsets. We were one of the few that had it. Um, and I, I didn't really consider that much of an upset. I mean, those that were involved in our program really did not consider that an upset by seed. It was an upset, but we felt like we were just as good as Louisville and we'd beaten them by 18 the year before. So, um, but yeah, that to, for us to get a host site, it's really not a bid process. 
the women's selection committee takes the top 16 teams and seeds them one through four. And each one of those top 16 seeds gets a host site. So you, you have to earn it on the court, which is a really good thing. Uh, but it's, it's hard for a, for a non autonomy five or autonomy four to get those, get those sites. Uh, so, so we'll see, um, as we move forward on women's basketball, but I'm excited about, I, I'm bullish on the tournament. The, the women are, the numbers are strong and there's hope for the future. When Caitlin, Gra Caitlin Clark graduates and goes to the WNBA, there's Juju Watkins and the, these phenomenal freshmen that are ready to replace them for star power. So I think that it's here to stay. And I'm just glad I'm so grateful that our women's basketball team is part of that wave and it, uh, and they're so appreciative in our local community and statewide that this is a basketball women's basketball area. And we're so excited that, that our women are part of a part of that March madness. Yeah. And I think the biggest struggle and you can attest to it is the scheduling aspect of it. That's the only way a team like MTSU can sneak into that top 16 is that non-conference schedule. So, I mean, that's something that I know you guys have to go to war with every off season about getting teams to play MTSU. Yeah, we do. And, and so, uh, you know, we were very excited that Kelly Harper, you know, signed off on a series with UT where we play one in Huntsville go back to Knoxville, come back to Murphy Center, go back to Knoxville. So it's a four-year deal. And now that Kelly's not there, I, you always worry whether the new coach wants to continue that series and those kind of things. So uh, those games are hard to get. That's why Rick is such good friends with Jeff Walls at, at Louisville because he'll play those games. He'll play us. He, he, he recognizes our value. So... So Louisville is always kind of be on our schedule, and but they're hard to get. It's hard to get those kind of teams to come to your place. Absolutely, and he he said in his first opening press conference that Jeff is one of the good guys, and it and he is, and it certainly is nice to have. But at this point, you know, our ladies' program is to the point where it's going to be a quality win for those teams. Like if Tennessee were to have beat us on a neutral floor this year, it, they would have been a beneficiary of that. And, and same goes for Louisville when they played us at our at our at our place last year. It didn't hurt their their net or their RPI. If anything, it probably benefited them to lose that game as opposed to someone another. You know lesser group of five so that's got to be a selling point point. and it, i think it's a good game it's a, a to your point jake to it doesn't hurt them at all on their, their net rank rankings and those kind of things in fact it can enhance it and then the other thing is is that they know that particularly when they come to murphy center they're going to come and play before a really knowledgeable women's basketball crowd that will be enthusiastic about the, the blue raiders but that's a great test for another team to come in before they start their conference play for a coach to really see where their, their team's at before they enter SEC or ACC. This is a really good game for them to judge it by. And, and, and so it's, it's a really good game. So uh, I think our name's getting strong enough now that, that the women's basketball fans recognize that we're a good program and, and it's not as devastating when a Louisville gets beat by Middle Tennessee with their local fan base and all those kind of things, because that's what coaches worry about is like, if I play them, will it cost me my job, mm -hmm. you know, and that kind of thing. And so we got to try to remove that best we can. So I always kind of compare it to Gonzaga on the men's side. Gonzaga 10 years ago had to go through that, that kind of growth. And now nobody bats an eye. It's uh, when you play Gonzaga, I mean, it's, it's 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 a tremendous win if you can get get a victory against them. So that's where we need to get to is that kind of point, uh, like Gonzaga on the men's side. Absolutely. Well, we'll change gears here. Another new development for the university this last spring is the um, the NIL Collective Raider Rising. You got you've created an official partnership there, and there's an opportunity tomorrow night on Wednesday over at the Boulevard from six to eight for the Lady Raiders. And I believe I saw today that 15 percent of the proceeds will go to the Raider Rising to support the NIL. And I, I just have this question for you just as. As a typical fan, and I would say I, I probably measure up in, in regards to finances to most, I, I would consider myself middle class. Um, you know, if we're, if we're contributing to the BRAA 
And then now the rate of rising, their program that starts out at $1,000 a year, it's kind of a steep price for those of us that are, may already, already be contributing to the BRAA. Is there any sort of future plans in place for those that want to, say, contribute to both? We don't want to lose our benefits that are the BRAA, but we still like we understand the importance of the NIL. And I'm sure you can and you have a, an interesting perspective because you can see it from both sides. So I guess my, my main question is, is my, me as a fan that doesn't have all this bukus of money to throw at the university, where should my allegiance lie? Or is there ever an opportunity where I could be able to split my, you know, my, my budgeting 50 50 for rate of rising and for the BRAA? Yeah, and that, that, that those are great questions, Jake and, and I usually tell donors that when they ask me that question, that kind of turn it back to them, like wh wherever your passion is. Like uh, if you really want to help student athletes economically, the Raiders Rising is probably a good avenue for you because that'll go directly to, to them in, in a collective. If you are interested in bricks and mortar and facilities, then our Capital Build Blue campaign. If you are interested in their academic well-being, then our BRAA annual gifts and, and those kind of things. So, and then there are some people that have very specific passions about those kind of things. And, and those are easy. Somebody like you, that's a, a general fan and just kind of wants to know where to direct the money. I, I think it's perfectly okay to, 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 to half it, you know, and those kind of things. And, and what we've done is try to readjust our fundraising goals. So we, count the collective, even though it might not hit our treasury books at the university as part of our total fundraising number, because I don't want Lee DeLeon and his team going out saying, well, that's not part of our goals, because uh, we need to think about in everything we do, how we can get more money to the student athletes. And some of that's going to require a little bit of change of thought and, and and typically we do have a uh, end of the year type acknowledgement for our teams when they do well. And, and it was sort of my idea to come up with, uh, hey, let's see if the Boulevard will donate 15%, called Jeff over there. And, and he was more than willing to do that, of course. And, and so 15% of those proceeds will go to the NIL collective for women's basketball. And so those kids will, will be able to benefit off of their show, so to speak. And I think that's a really good way for us to, to kind of get into our donor base a little bit differently. The, the hey, you're going to eat, come eat with us on Wednesday night, come to lunch on Wednesday at the Boulevard and 15% of your hamburger at the Boulevard will go to, to our women's basketball. So if you really support the women's basketball program, and want those kids to have a little bit of extra change in their pocket, that's a really easy way for you to donate. And we need to find opportunities like that because all of us in, in our industry worry about donor fatigue and those kind of things. And, and so we have to be very careful about how we go about doing this. But I, I think those are avenues that are really easy to, to, put, to put some NIL deals uh, in front of our and student athletes. Is there ever a plan to kind of merge the two um, groups as, in regards to the collective and the BRA? Like, is there, will there ever be some sort of partnership there where, like I said, I can give, give one to both? Yeah. And right now that's prohibited by NCA rules. Okay. And, and they're looking at actually in August, there's some legislation that, that might change all of that. And so that's the, one of the frustrating things about NIL is that, every four or five months, the rules all change, mm -hmm. you know, so it's hard to develop a really good policy and systems in place, knowing that, that it, they could all be wiped out in a, in a couple of months. So I, I think there's a lot of movement to allow these uh, collectives to be brought inside the university and those kind of things. And once that hits your books, then, then there are opportunities that you described that, that, that that's just another checkoff point. We do have an area like uh, already that exists and not to be too complicated, but it's a, uh, uh, there was a court case, the Alston court case where the NCA can pay almost $6,000. Each school can pay $6,000 a year in additional educational expenses. 
And so we do raise money towards it uh, as part of the BRAA because that money actually hits our books and we, we were able to disperse that as additional financial aid. So right now, every student athlete gets $1,000 uh, extra with that. We'd like to have it be more. Our, our women's basketball team has a donor that's fully funded that. So they get all their $5,980 in what's called the Alston Fund. Uh, but so there's, it gets really confusing for donors. There's the Alston Fund. There is the NIL, which is a straight sponsorship. And then there's a collective. And, and, and so I think there's some confusion out there. And as we settle in more and this stuff becomes more routine, I, I think then the, the, that educational process will be, easier for people to understand what's your thoughts on it creating some sort of parity in in on all sports i think we saw it a lot last year with the nil wasn't in effect last year but you see the fau san diego state you see all these g5s in the final four this year we're kind of back to an all chalk final four but that's just one example uh, do you see this this nil creating more parity across division one collectively or will there be a great divide between the the power fives and the group fives and Jake, I'm going to challenge your statement that the men's final four is not really all chalk because you got a number 11 seed, yeah. North Carolina State in there that, that kind of came out of nowhere. Right. You know, and was the automatic qualifier. I mean, Greg Sankey made a big deal out of some of the automatic qualifiers getting in. And there's mm -hmm. another AQ that, that went to gotten in except for the AQ that, that's made it to the final four. So, uh Time will tell on, on that. Uh, I think that uh, basketball, you you can change over your roster so quickly, as we described, like North Carolina didn't make the tournament last year, and all they're one seed this year and had a, a really remarkable season. You know, and so though, those highs and lows, it'll be interesting to see what, how Kentucky reacts to to their issues right now, you know, and, and those kind of things. So I don't think, I think the, the economics were always stacked against us, whether there was NIL or not. So I, I don't see it as that much of a substantive change. If you get, if your team's older and, and particularly in the sport of basketball, then you have a chance to beat guys that are younger than you. And, and if you're a more cohesive unit, you have those opportunities to do that. Uh, so, I'm bullish about the basketball tournament. I think it's one of the great sporting events in America and, and I hope we don't change it, you know, and I, I hope that those AQs still remain intact. So St. Peter's can go to the elite eight, you know, and you, you see those kind of things. So every now and then when you give David to rock, he can slay the giant, you know? And, and so I just, the AQs are rock and we need to keep that. And, and fight for it and make sure that the NCAA tournament doesn't get ruined by some of the powers to be. Yeah, I know Sankey caught a lot of flack for that comment, um, especially seeing Kentucky go down and Auburn go down as early as they did. So uh, it would be a shame for something like that to happen. And we're kind of seeing the development where college football is expanding to 12. And as you said, you know, David's getting an opportunity now against those schools where, you know, if, if the college football playoff expands, and I think it, it is inevitable that we'll see it past 12 at some point in time, maybe not soon, but at some point in time that these upsets will just continue to happen across more sports. And we see it in baseball every year. Again, it's not as prominent as basketball and football or as televised, but I think those opportunities are arising. Yeah. It's a, you know, it's sports is still a funny thing, you know, and the Yankees could have all the money in the world and not win the world series. I mean, so we just kind of look at the pros and, you know, and, and that's the one thing that I wish that the, again, that the powers understand that the, being nationally relevant is important to be spread out all, all, through all the geographic areas of the United States. So if all the football power is just concentrated in the Southeast, then that's not necessarily a great thing in the long term for college football. It's good to have Southern Cal be good. It's good to have Washington be good, you know, and so it generates interest in areas away from the South as well. So I, I, I think that, 
I always say that, yeah, that you get paid to oversee your school, oversee your conference, whatever the role might be, whether you're commissioner AD, but also, and I think we've lost some of this, that we need to be better guardians of our games, you know, and, and so we need to be true to basketball. We need to be true to football. And I, I don't think that my colleagues have particularly done that very well, that, well, this is best. And now we got Stanford, the outcomes of is that you have Stanford and Cal in the Atlantic Coast Conference. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. And it's just uh, stuff that that really got uh, greed and, and analytics and, and not talking about maybe overall what's good for the game and what's good for the student athletes. So I hope that that pendulum will swing back the other way and we'll get more rational thought about how we're going to go about our future. Well, Change gears once again here. Keep rolling through these questions that I have for you. Uh, someone had presented this to me a while back, um, and it was about, well, one, we've seen this resurfacing of the MAC, and you, we already touched on that topic. I'm not going to make you revisit that, but w but Western Kentucky had some interest with the MAC, and we know that you've made the stance that what us staying in the conference you would say was the best move for us at, the, at that time, and I still personally believe that that statement is true. But one thing that was brought to me, we were looking at the 1099 from Conference USA, and we look at the distribution for MTSU at 10.1 million. I believe that was in 2022 was the last one that they had released. Um, and that was be, that was worlds, almost 5 million beyond the next. So again, school me on this because I, I don't know much past that. I'm just interested to know wh why such a large discrepancy for I'm not going to, I'm sure you're not upset about it either, but why the large discrepancy from MTSU, uh, say to second place, Western at 6 million? Yeah, that uh, number one, it was a good idea for us to 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 stay at, in Conference USA, and and we were able to by by Florida Atlantic making a push to the Final Four, by Liberty getting into the New Year's Six games, that's helped solidify those revenue streams. So we were able to take advantage of a lot of things, and back when we were deciding uh, MAC versus Conference USA, and. And so uh, there was a lot of entrance and exit fees that were being negotiated and, and those kind of things. And so uh, it, it really worked out well for us to, to be able to do that. And, and that was some of the money that we were able to buy out coach stocks. So we kind of set some of that aside kind of for a rainy day like, like that. So uh, we, we, we had a plan and we executed our plan kind of as it related to the MAC and Conference USA. And, and you can see we we're kind of the beneficiaries of it. How so, uh, how so us compared to the others? Like I said, Western was at 6 million and we were at 10. Where's that, I mean, that, that 4 million discrepancy, was there something like that? Again, I, I don't know much about it. I'm just curious to know what, why the, why the gap there? Yeah. And, and, and I, I'm not sure I haven't seen the 1099. I, I don't know kind of what Western received and, and that kind of thing. So, so I, I, I know what we got. I, I, I'm not sure I can comment very mm -hmm. accurately on what Western got. I got you. Yeah, it was just an interesting figure. And I think, yeah. again, on the on the, the conversation of Mac versus CUSA, and I have not looked at Mac's 1099 from that same year, but I'd have to imagine, you know, that that's a good chunk of change to stay in Conference USA. And, yeah. and as you point out, it's, it's a, it was a reward to stay. That was a good enticement. And then, Jake, the, the other thing to consider is that uh, the Mac was charging us entrance fees as well. So, mm -hmm. so our net was really a wild swing. Like when you put it on a financial statement, the amount that it would cost you to get out of conference USA plus to buy your way into the Mac was, was, was really, uh, astronomical when you compared that to, to kind of what you would receive if you just simply stayed put and then try to work real hard to surround yourself with good partners and, and grow the league back up. So a little bit similar to maybe what Oregon state and Washington state, you know, they whittled themselves down to two, but for them, it's been a little bit of a financial windfall. Now their key will be, can they rebuild their own league? And I'm not sure they can. We, we were probably better positioned in conference USA because there was five of us that remained, um, uh, than, than maybe Western State, Washington State, and Oregon State. So, um, yeah, it was it, it was a good move financially for us and culturally. I, I think we all point to the South. We all relate to the South more uh, than we would in the MAC. So, it, at the end of the day, when you really 
stacked them up side by side. Uh, those those were kind of the issues that were discussed. Well, um, another new partnership uh, this summer or this spring that was announced was your partnership with Tamar Sales. And I, I know they made an announcement uh, on the Go Blue Raider website as well as on the socials. And uh, I would say the statement was a little vague other than, you know, they're going to handle ticket sales and, and it looked like they were going to handle some game day stuff as well. I was just a little interested to hear your piece on what that partnership entails and how does that intend to boost revenue if it does for the university? Yeah, and it, uh, the, it really is what's called outbound ticket sales. So we have basically this dedicated company that these people that will do nothing but place calls to people that may be lapsed season ticket holders to solicit group sales, to, to really go out and, and mine those markets. Uh, Tamar has had a lot of success in doing that and been able to grow the fan base. So, you know, when we made the change in football and kind of watching Derek the first really couple of weeks of how he's interacting with the, with the, with our public, and we really had a couple choices, like as it relates to a company like Tamar, do we go ahead and do it? Because our sales will likely go up just by the activation of Derek Mason and kind of how he's connecting with our public. Uh, so should we should we just not do that and maybe save their fees, what they charge us, and be good and maybe evaluate that in a year or two down the road? Or option B was hey, let's strike while the iron is the hottest and let's see how we can maximize this the quickest. And that's what we decided to do. We're making a greater investment in football. We've put more money into salaries uh, on the coaching staff and, and hired different positions in recruiting. Uh, we've put more money in nutrition and the weight and conditioning programs, all those kind of things. So we've we've added a lot of money, uh, several hundred thousand dollars into our football program. And so we need a little, we need a return on that. And the best way to return on that is to bring some life to our ticket sales and to have dedicated people that have no other responsibilities other than to sell tickets. And that's what this company does for us. Sometimes uh, our, as a university employee, you get caught doing other things you know, and, and the bureaucracy of a university. So we decide it's best to go out and let's just hire this and and see how well they do. And and they've got a good track record. I know the people at the head of the organization for a long time, so I trust them. They're going to give us good people to, to work with and, and to go out there and be our representatives. And quite honestly, we need to do a better job with that, with the group sales in particular. Uh, you know, and to, to offer it up to companies and to, for events and and have a really nice structure in place. So if you're looking for a birthday party for your child, come to our game, you know, and this is the package that you can purchase and it'll be a unique and great birthday party and have a visit from Lightning at the game, you know, and, and those kind of things just to have people put those kind of things together for us, I, I think will be a lot better. Uh, and we'll be able to reach more people and get our message out. So uh, Floyd Stadium is going to be a fun place to be in the fall. So we wanted just to, to put as much into it as we could this first year. So we're excited about our Tamar. Uh, yeah, and, and I think it segues great into my next question. As far as when we first talked, we, we were you're doing something a little bit different where you're doing the down payments for the for the tickets, and now you've you've, you've got – um, those, those sales that are coming through now that you've got a price and all that, have, are we seeing a tangible number? Like, is, are we seeing an increase we have, in sales? And, you know, it's still early in the ticket selling process. So those numbers get a little distorted, but, but we're running way ahead of where we were a year ago in comparison. But again, are just people more excited and just sending their money in earlier? You know, so you got to temper your excitement a little bit. I, I think a better gauge right now is in our BRAA memberships. And and right now I just got a report this morning that, that we're running 50 members ahead. We've got 50 new members into our BRAA since I think January. And so that's a really important thing. And, and uh, we're just now really starting to reach out to the first time season ticket holders. So those numbers will come more in June and July and, and those kind of things. So 
things are ticking up. We just want to be able to to maximize it as much as we can. But uh, I think we're going to sell more football tickets than we have in a long time, and that's certainly our goal. And I think we'll see the increase just from the football recruiting side alone. And me and Austin Lewis talked with Derek Mason a few weeks ago about how he's recruiting the the mid state area very well. Which that in turn, you got you know. Little Billy has 12 uh, family members that are just 30 minute drive over. Like that's, you know, that's a season ticket right there in, in and of itself. And I think that's going to help significantly with, with the ticket sales and all that stuff. And that's pretty exciting. And um, I know we've, we, you've talked ad nauseum about Derek Mason and what he's brought to the university in such a short period of time, but I, I'm just interested to hear the, the spring game returning. Where's kind of your excitement. He has a staff fully stocked now and he's kind of ready to go. Where is, where is Chris Massaro's gauge on, on Derek Mason thus far? And what's your excitement level for fall? Yeah. I mean, his off season, he's gotten an A plus plus. I mean, just the, the biggest thing is, you, you know, like when we're interviewing coaches, you kind of think that every coach is going to have like, football expertise you know so yeah you're going to drill into that a little bit but you also want to really kind of who's can connect with our fan base who who's very relatable uh who will people get behind uh how will this person present themselves to recruits and, and those kind of things and so far in this off season Derek and his staff have been tremendous in this area and we've made more progress, more headway with uh, local high school coaches than, than I thought was really plausible. Not possible, but plausible. And uh, uh, so he's done a really good job there. Uh, the connection to our fans has been really great. Uh, I'm thinking that he's also connected to the Murfreesboro community as a whole. And, and that's one of our keys is our fans are our fans. I mean, we, we're all automatically kind of easy to communicate with, but we need to get that circle a little bit broader and bring in people that are mildly interested in MTSU and make them uh, more passionate about what we're trying to do over here. And Derek's done that, inviting them to games and those kind of things. So, so that part's been good. That Then when you look at how he's managing his football team and you watch a practice, you, you see how the, the strength and conditioning, you, you hear reports from the training room that the, and, and the academic people on how supportive he is to their efforts and, and installing a sense of discipline all the way through the organization. And that makes you super excited. So, uh, so I'm very bullish on, on what Derek's brought the first three months to, to our university. And just uh, we just need to keep it up. I mean, he needs help. Uh, we need to finance our expectations. So it's really important for people that are listening to this podcast to, to get involved, buy a season ticket, join the collective, do, do, do whatever you can to help our program, whatever is possible with you. Because the most important thing we can do is to put people in the stadium because that's a visible sign of support. So if there's just one thing that you're asking yourself what you can do is buy season tickets and come to the games and cheer for the Blue Raiders and be entertained because it'll be a fun, it is, it's going to be a fun fall. And it should be. And I know they get started with, with um, you got Tennessee Tech rolling in. So you got local, uh, local competition there. It'll be, it'll be, again, as you say, Floyd Stadium will be a fun place to be this fall for multitude of reasons. And another thing that's going on there um, in the north end zone is that SAPC still going along. Do you have any updates uh, for the fans? Yeah, that uh, the, there's the steel's coming out of the ground. Uh, so those of you that haven't been to campus lately that you can see like the, the, how the second floor of the building now is formed up in the steel. Uh, you can see actually our interior stairwells, which I don't know, that kind of excited me, Jake, just to <laughs> see the stairwells, man. It was like awesome. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, then the height of it, you can probably see it at its maximum height. So it's really starting to take some shape with the early steel. And so... They're still on target, still on target to, to cut the ribbon in the summer of 25. So there's, there's a long ways to go. We still got a little bit over a year, but it's going to be this, the next few months, we're going to see remarkable progress on that. And, uh, just really excited about the look of the building and, and how it's going to be. 
and then we're also uh, part of this project is that uh, we're building a new loading dock uh, on the uh, the south uh, south east side of the of Murphy Center, mm-hmm. uh, the side closest to our football press box, and so that's kind of the first step of phase two is to you know relocate that Murphy Center loading dock. So one day we'll want to put a building there with a grand entrance rather than bring people through by the trash cans and those kind of things. So, so that part's going on. Uh, we're building a new control room, which will start right after the graduations. Uh, so all of our, uh, all of our electronic equipment uh, for the scoreboards and those kind of production capabilities will be, we've converted one of the, cons- we're converting one of the concession stands in the, in the Murphy Center concourse. Uh, so Nathan Wallach and his team will, will have more toys and modern equipment so we can do a better presentation on the video boards, the new video boards in the Murphy Center. And then this summer, we'll see a new video board go up in football as well. So, so we'll have better production capabilities on both those uh, next year. So just trying to do everything we can to enhance the, the fan experience. Uh, but that, that building, the Student Athlete Performance Center is a really game changer for us because that building's huge, 86,000 square feet, and it's going to really help all of our student athletes. And, and the crane, is it still out there? It's still there and it'll be there for a while. Well, they, the, I remember when it, when it came out that there was an orange and white checkered flag on the top of that thing, all hell broke loose. And I think uh, to rest assured for people that don't know that that's there for clearance level purposes and it's orange and red, it's mandatory that it has to be or orange and white and it's mandatory. It has to be orange. There's no allegiance to UT on that crane. Is that correct? That is correct. And one of the things we did kind of to, to help, mitigate that is when the crane first went up we put the mt flag right right mm-hmm. below it so we have the aeronautics flag which just happens to be the like this this orange checkerboard thing but it's a requirement mm-hmm. and then the middle tennessee flag right below it so so it's waving proudly up there for all to see Absolutely. Yeah. I just, I just think it's funny how some people can make a mountain out of a molehill and something like a checkered flag on a crane was the end of the world for us. And it was some sign of disrespect and it was simply just a safety protocol is all it was. So, um, well, well, that's, that's exciting news. I know a lot of people are excited to see that go up, but the one thing you mentioned there was the video board. I know it's been a while since that's been upgraded and I think it's, it's great that you, you say that it's going to be installed and ready to go by this fall. Yeah. That's uh, I think the plans to block off Falconberry, uh, some, I think it's in the month of June. And so the cranes can get in there and, and lift in the new video board. So, so it, it'll be put together by the end of July and be operational by football season. Awesome. Awesome stuff. Well, um, Chris, it's, it's been a pleasure to have you on once again and answer my questions. Um, some, some be it, I'm sure you were prepared for, you've heard them a million times from fans and, and I always love that you're willing to do this. And I got a lot of compliments from people, not only from MTSU, but I have plenty of friends that I'm, I'm we're doing a, a collaboration that we're going to announce in a couple of weeks, but a lot of those have re- have reached out and listened and, and they're actually, they, they couldn't believe that the athletic director was willing to come on. And so again, I know that you don't have to do this, but I appreciate you coming on and answering some of these questions. Well, Jake, and thanks for all your patience that, that uh, Jake was trying to schedule me. And, and I said, let's kind of wait till our women's basketball run ends because my schedule gets so iffy, hoping that we'd be in Albany, New York and those mm-hmm. kind of things. So uh, so thanks for your patience, Jake. And thanks for what you do for Middle Tennessee. It's important that we get the word out and we, we talk to our fans, whether, uh, you know, like sometimes I may not agree with what fans or what the dialogue is, but it's better to have dialogue out there than no, than nothing. So, so appreciate it. And uh, let's all work together and, and support Nick and, and support Derek and support Rick and all of our other sports. Cause uh, we have a chance to really have a great year next year. I can't wait. Absolutely. All right. Thanks again. See you, man. Thank you. Thanks for sticking around to the Blue Raider wrap-up portion of the episode where we go over the last week in review of Blue Raider sports. We'll start off with baseball, who had a disappointing week, dropping all four contests starting on Tuesday in Bloomington against Indiana. The Raiders dropped that contest 5-12. to And then this weekend hosting the Binghamton Bearcats at, 
Bree Smith Jr. Field dropping all three games of that contest. Friday losing 4-8, to eight, then on Saturday 0-9, to nine, and then on Sunday a mercy ruled shortened 3-14. My MVP of the weekend does go to Briggs Rudder, who went 4-11 for 11 with a run and a double. But they are back in action this week, and they will be on the road all week, as tonight they are in Cookville facing Tennessee Tech Golden Eagles. That first pitch is at 6 p.m., and then they're back into Conference USA play facing off against a very good Louisiana Tech team in Ruston, Louisiana. That series will start on Friday at 6 p.m., Saturday's games at 2, and Sunday at 1 p.m., and all of those games will be viewable on ESPN+. Softball had a good weekend as they take home a win, series win against the FIU Golden Panthers. They beat the Golden Panthers on Thursday by a score of 9 to 3, dropped the second game contest 3 to 6 and then swept up the series there on Saturday with a walk-off 8-7 win. Ansley Blevins goes 5 for 12 on the week with two runs, seven RBIs, a walk and two home runs and Cameron Karsich goes 2 and 0 on the weekend with both of the wins going 13 and a third innings pitch, giving up 17 hits, just six earned runs, two walk, and seven strikeouts. Mary Martinez also pitches in the loss, but in her efforts, it was only one earned run despite the the defense kind of not backing her up very well in that Friday matchup. But nonetheless, she has a great performance, and hopefully you can back her up again this next week as they are back in Conference USA play in Huntsville, Texas against Sam Houston State. That series will begin on Friday, and that first pitch is at 6 p.m. Saturday is at 3.30 p.m., and Sunday is at 12.30 p.m. Looking for a sweep this weekend as they face the last place Lady Bearcats. Men's tennis returned after a short break. They did pick up another top 25 win, beating the Memphis Tigers at home uh, 4-3. They did drop a doubles, which has kind of put on a little bit of a skid for the doubles teams, and they do bounce back later in the evening. But shout out to Leo Ray Queen, Tara Monlis, Matsuoka, and Cueto Ramos makes a return to the singles matchup, and they pick up all four points there, and all four were huge because they were needed to win against the 23rd ranked Tigers. And then on the back end of that doubleheader, the Raiders defeated Alabama A&M by a score of six to one. Doubles breaks off their snide finally. It's Ray Queen, Horak, Tara Monlis, Matsuoka, and Al Amin all pick up a win in singles. They wrap up their season this week uh, with a contest, their regular season they wrap up that is. They start on Tuesday against 44th ranked Vanderbilt at home and then on Sunday they will finish with a doubleheader against Tulane, a very good program, not ranked but um, a very uh, prominent program, an NCAA tournament team a year ago and then they'll finish up that doubleheader with a game against or a match against UNC Asheville and that will begin at 4 p.m. All the games this week are at the brand new tennis complex so if you haven't seen them yet now's your last chance before that conference USA tournament coming up in a few weeks. Women's tennis they go one and two on the week they, they dropped their first contest to DePaul by a score of one to four it was Eloise Warbrick with the lone singles win and then they made a road trip out west at New Mexico State losing that contest two to four it was uh, Schmidt and Chap. Chef Falcar, who picked up the other singles win, and then they did pick up their first team win in El Paso against UTEP, winning 4-1. to one. Doubles got their first win of the week, along with Garakani, Payer, and Chef Falcar also picking up her second win of the week also. They face another Conference USA opponent in Liberty this Friday at home at 4 p.m. at the Outdoor Tennis Complex, and then they wrap up their regular season at Memphis on Sunday at 10 a.m. Men's golf returns back to action at the Mason Rudolph Championship in Franklin. It's hosted by Vanderbilt University. They're finally back after a short break for them. And then on the women's side, they had a really great finish last week at the Ozark National Invitational uh, there in Hollister, Missouri, um, finishing in second place out of 13 teams. Uh, Ella Manley um, impressively got an ace or uh, commonly known as a hole in one on her final hole, and that was just enough to put her into tied for second place in uh, in the individuals, and and all of the Lady Raiders finished in the top 40. You have Lauren Gilchrist and Nicole Johnson, and then individual Jillian Bowman that all went tied for 20th at 12 strokes over par. Molly Babelar goes for tied for 32nd at 14 strokes over par, and Lainey Campbell tied for 36 at 15 over par. So again, excellent week for the Lady Raiders golf program and then they will continue their 
season in Chattanooga this weekend from the 7th through the 9th, all in Chattanooga as a part of the Chattanooga Classic. Lastly, outdoor track and field. They returned from the Raleigh and Florida relays. They split them up. The sprinters and jumpers were in Raleigh, North Carolina, where Stephen Ologi placed fourth in the 110 meters. And then John Sherman ran a top 50 NCAA time of the year in the 100 meters at 10.39 seconds. And then all the distance runners were down in Florida. And to highlight some of those, Sammy Sang placed 10th in the 1500 meter. Purity Senga ran a top 65 NCAA time in the 5K at 16 minutes, 19.68 seconds. And then Nancy Mayow runs a top 100 NCAA time in the 10K at 34 minutes, 56.9 seconds. They will be back in action at the Tennessee Relays up in Knoxville here soon. And that'll pretty much do it for us. I appreciate everyone tuning in, um, listening to this much-anticipated episode with Chris Massaro once again. I know that we're not necessarily able to answer all the questions that those of you that got to uh, me at GoMiddle.com, and I do appreciate those answers that are being written in. Of course, we will be over there at the conclusion of this episode to discuss all the topics that happened or all the topics that were covered today, and I'm always welcome to your feedback, and it's, it's certain that I will have Massaro on at some point in time again, and hopefully we can continue great conversation i think it's important that we we don't take for granted that the athletic director is willing to sit for us i understand that it's not always the answers that we want to hear i'm not always able to get the answers that you want to hear but it is important that we have that sort of dialogue and i think it's vital that we have that between the athletic director and the fans even though again we don't always disagree, we always just we may not always agree or disagree with what he has to say but again it, it's important and i'm glad i can be that segue um, for some of you guys so but don't forget to follow us on all of our socials over at instagram twitter and tiktok at blue raider pod and of course continue the conversation over at gomiddle.com as always um don't miss out on, on a collaboration announcement coming up as i alluded to in the episode um with college football that's coming up we will have some news to you here in the middle of april with that as, as i'm partnering with um, a podcasting group to Uh, basically help with coverage of the Conference USA Group of Five and all that good stuff. So a lot to look forward to from the Blue Raider podcast, as well as hopefully some merchandising opportunities with NIL um, incentives for some athletes and just some things that I'm I'm really excited about rolling out for you guys coming up this summer. But um, that'll wrap it up for today's episode. I appreciate everyone tuning in, and I'll catch you next week. And until then, go Blue.